Recorder's Court, Quebec City, October 1946. The case, the City of Quebec versus Laurier Saumur. The charge, a violation of Bylaw 184, banning the distribution of written materials without a permit from the Chief of Police. Saumur is a Jehovah's Witness. He has been arrested 30 times for breaking this law. On an October afternoon in 1946, young Laurier Samir left his home and headed for Saint Eustache, a suburb of Quebec City. He carried an armful of Jehovah's Witnesses' religious pamphlets to hand out. There began a seven-year-long ordeal for Laurier Samir. At issue in this case, the fundamental rights and freedoms of every Canadian. The case even led one justice of the Supreme Court of Canada to declare Canadians have no rights. By the time of Laurier Samir's latest conviction, the 250 Jehovah's Witnesses in Quebec and the province's Roman Catholic Church, representing millions, have been locked in a vicious struggle for three decades. To the Witnesses, traditional churches are satanic, and the Catholic Church in Quebec is a special target of witness attacks. At the urging of the Church, government and police harass the Witnesses at every turn. But the witnesses defy every effort to control their street corner and door-to-door -door preaching. Laurier Samur is 25, a farmer's son from the Gatineau. He became a Jehovah's Witness while working in the mines near Timmins, Ontario. He believes the devil dominates commerce, politics, and other religions, that only witnesses are Christians, and that Satan's organizations will be destroyed in the Battle of Armageddon. Like all witnesses, Saumur, who is also a minister, is compelled by his beliefs to distribute literature published by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Saumur doesn't see himself as defying Quebec's laws. He is simply following God's law. In the pursuit of his religion, Saumur is arrested and jailed 106 times. Lawyer Saumur was... Um a uh, very uh, strong man physically. He had an imposing personality, but uh, he was like a lamb. He was a very mild individual, uh, very loving, uh, very kind, and very considerate. And he loved people. And because of his love for people, it motivated him to be very zealous. Je travaillais avec M. Saumur. J'aimais beaucoup être en sa compagnie. Je le trouvais vraiment un brave homme. I worked with Mr. Saumur. I found him a brave man to have lived through all these persecutions and imprisonments. qu'il a vécu, ses emprisonnements. Souvent, mon père est allé à la prison. My father would often go to Quebec City prison to fetch him and bring him back to our home. Alors, je trouvais cet homme-là très, très courageux pour faire face à So I found him very courageous to have faced the religious machine that dominated Quebec at that time. From its beginning in Pennsylvania in the 1870s, Jehovah's Witness has been unpopular because of their intolerance of other religions. Its founder, Charles Taz Russell, believed Christ will return to Earth. Lawyer Joseph Rutherford takes over the Watchtower Society in 1917 and transforms it. He welcomes court cases as a way of spreading the word and the society branches out to dozens of countries. The printing press, radio, and door-to-door -door solicitation extend its reach dramatically. By 1918, witnesses in Canada are having their first conflicts with the law. Many Canadians resent their hard-sell methods. They came on Sundays, they knocked at the door at breakfast time, at dinner time, and I just don't feel that this is right. And I asked them not to come back anymore, but they would come back more and more and more until finally, I mean, I felt that the sign was the best way to prevent this, and it has worked 100%. They're doing these things that make them unpopular, which to them, of course, is a sign that they're doing the right thing. Because the more um, uh, suppression and oppression they face, the more they know they're on the right track. In order to continue their door-to-door -door ministry, witnesses had to deceive the law. 
we would see the police at a distance, and if we did, then uh, we would go towards them while the others would uh, go in another direction so that they would not see the relationship between us and them. And uh, that way, uh, uh, they would come after me or come after Laurier and allow uh, our people to find, to find an escape. When we went from house to house, we never knew behind the door what we were to expect. It could be someone that was, uh, that could hurt us, that could uh, hit us. We've seen cases of uh, people coming out with a broom just to hit you with it, or even the, they'd open the door and a bucket of cold water hit you. We were always uh, apprehensive as to what could happen to us. Quebecers find witness tactics offensive and relentless. All too often, Jehovah's Witnesses disturb the peace. Their speeches blare from loudspeakers mounted on cars. And prevented the common people from hearing the truth. Those clergymen claimed to be serving God, but Jesus told them in plain words that they were serving the devil. Along the waterfront, more loudspeakers. Turn the people away from the true Almighty God. The message is always the same. Armageddon is near, and only witnesses will enjoy the Garden of Eden paradise to come. The only people who will be saved and restored to a paradise here on earth are people who are Jehovah's Witnesses who are, as they put it, in the truth. Let's say you knew that only Jehovah's Witnesses were going to be saved, then it's quite likely you'd be quite persistent in bringing your message to other people so that they could be saved. Je suis un ministre chrétien, et voici mon fils qui est aussi un ministre étudiant de la Bible. Quebec's population is overwhelmingly Roman Catholic, 90% by some estimates. The church, stung by the witnesses' unrelenting attacks, fights back with a vengeance. Because the witnesses in their literature singled out the church for attack, and the Jehovah's Witnesses believed then that the Roman Catholic Church was a satanic institution, and they didn't shy away from saying this and from depicting uh, priests and nuns and church leadership in the most unflattering terms. And having looked at all this literature and having studied it, there's really no doubt that should any group produce literature like this today, it would classify as hate propaganda under the Canadian Criminal Code. With the outbreak of World War II, the leader of the Catholic Church in Quebec, Jean-Marie Rodrigue Cardinal Villeneuve, sees an opportunity to rid Quebec of the annoying witnesses. Villeneuve's support of the war is desperately needed. Liberal Prime Minister Mackenzie King obtains that support by declaring that Jehovah's Witnesses an illegal organization. They'd recently banned the Communist Party and all these fascist groups, and so it was that the government passed an order in council banning the Jehovah's Witnesses. Overnight, it was illegal. This was in July 1940. It was illegal to be a Jehovah's Witness. Now, what's particularly ironic about this is that we then became the second country in the world to ban the Jehovah's Witnesses. And what was the first country? It was Nazi Germany. Witness children see their fathers rounded up and sent to internment camps, denied conscientious objector status. When witness children in Ontario refuse to salute the flag or sing God Save the King, they are denied schooling. Some are taken from their parents, Others are sent to juvenile detention centers. Without a doubt, this ranks as the most serious infringement of religious liberty in the history of the country. Three, four thousand people were told they couldn't gather, they couldn't worship God as they wished, and they couldn't tell others about God in the way they wanted, namely by publishing His truth through the written means and by telling people about it in their homes and elsewhere. 
The RCMP supports the ban. Witnesses are arrested in droves. At the time, we would be chased when we did our work going door to door. You had to hide when you saw a policeman in the area. There are no safe havens for the witnesses. They are forced to meet in secret. Forbidden from distributing literature, they persist in their proselytizing, carrying only a Bible on their furtive rounds. At the very beginning, we would meet in private homes. There weren't a large number of Jehovah's Witnesses in Quebec City. The ban is partially lifted in 1943, but life is still difficult, and in Quebec, things are about to become even tougher. The war ends in Europe, but Quebec immediately launches a so-called war against subversion. In 1944, Maurice Duplessis and his Union Nationale party are returned to power after spending most of the war years in opposition. In the election, Duplessis campaigned against two enemies, the Witnesses and the Communists. Against the Witnesses, he declares a war without mercy. Old bylaws are suddenly enforced to stop the witnesses. New bylaws are enacted prohibiting witnesses from preaching door to door. The Jehovah's Witnesses were subjected to the same harassing bylaws and charges in the United States. But there they had the protection of the First Amendment, and they had won numerous victories before the American Supreme Court. It encouraged Glenn Howe and the Canadian witnesses to launch a new legal strategy. Duplessis' war against the Jehovah's Witnesses accelerates. Glenn Howe, a rookie lawyer and a witness, joins the legal team. Many witnesses, including Laurier Samir, are sent out to test the law. And uh, they no sooner got started there than we began to have arrests, which began really at, uh, in 1944. So at the end of 1944, we had 40 cases in Quebec. And in 1945, we had 400 cases. In 1946, we had 800 cases. Anti-witness sentiment in Quebec is whipped into a frenzy by Duplessis and his supporters. In Chateauguay, in September 1945, Laurier Saumur is a victim of mob violence. We were trying to have a meeting on private property, and uh, Laurier was, uh, was there, and, and uh, as he tried to leave, when there was a whole mob got hold of him, he was injured by, uh, beaten up by this mob. So there was, this was, was a real uh, riotous stuff, very violent and the police doing nothing about it. It was a Sunday morning. I was preaching from house to house with uh, another friend of ours, and uh, my wife was with his wife at the other end of the street, and I worked my way with my friend towards uh, where our wives were, only to realize that uh, there was a mob action that had been fomented by some people and a whole crowd of youngsters were there, and they were throwing stone at uh, my wife and uh, my friend's wife. And then the next thing we saw was the police had been called, and uh, they came on the scene, and they um, immediately arrested uh, our wives, and they were brought to the police station and arrested for disturbing the peace. The witnesses launch a counterattack. Their presses pour out one and a half million copies of a pamphlet titled Quebec's Burning Hate for God and Christ and Freedom is the Shame of All Canada. 
Half a million copies are printed in French. It's a bitter denunciation of the Quebec government and the Catholic Church. Another pamphlet follows. Two million copies of Quebec, you have failed your people. To Premier de Plessis, the pamphlets are a declaration of war. Police launch a new wave of arrests. Well, as soon as de Plessis got hold of one of these, he just went ape. And uh, he said he was going to charge them all with sedition. In about three weeks, we had 1,600 cases instead. This was just a pattern of harassment. They'd file the cases and then do practically nothing about it. They wouldn't try them. They'd just force people to appear day after day for adjournments. And they, in fact, they had so many cases, they didn't have enough judge to try them anyway. Duplessis' campaign against the few hundred witnesses seems excessive, but he knows that by fighting the witnesses, he will keep the support of the influential Catholic Church and the Quebecois. So the war without mercy must go on. In Quebec City, posters sponsored by the League of the Sacred Heart appear on the streets. They urge Catholics to report sightings of Jehovah's Witnesses to radio-equipped patrol cars of the city police. They always had in mind to arrest us anyways. And so um, we had to go through the, the exercise of being brought to the police station. And then um, they would charge us with uh, distributing without a permit. And then um, they would take our tie and uh, our laces and our belt and uh, put us in, the, in a cell. And there you would be in a common cell with uh, all the ruffles of the city, uh, drunkards, uh, which was unpleasant. The recorder's court would always be in session about 10 o'clock. And then, of course, the charge was, was read, and we'd plead not guilty. We'd go back in the cell until someone came with, uh, uh, with the bail money to bail us out. But the next day, you'd go through the same drama again. And then you would hear the policemen, and some of them would say, well, I've, uh, I've picked up another five today. And then, uh, then the other policeman says, well, I haven't got five, I better go out and get some more. So we were like a game. Every morning, the first thing I had to do every morning was go down and get, a, uh, get bail, uh, bail out anybody had been arrested overnight. The cases never came up for, seldom came up for a hearing. And it was just a, a pattern of harassment. It was a reign of terror. It is almost impossible to appeal local ordinances like the Quebec City bylaw requiring police permission to distribute religious pamphlets. The witnesses must take their case to a higher court. So in 1947, we, we decided to begin an attack on the validity of the bylaw and the powers of the, both the city and the province to enact uh, censorship legislation. The issues are freedom of the press and freedom of religion. The witnesses' legal team discovers a long-forgotten statute on which to base their appeal. It is one that predates Confederation. It will be their trump card. One bylaw case out of hundreds is selected for the test, that of Laurier Samir. Laurier Samir never appears in Quebec Superior Court. Instead, he adopts the trial record of another Jehovah's Witness. This widens the issue far beyond the guilt or innocence of any one individual. Everyone's basic rights become the issue. By this unique test, Laurier Samir enters history's courtroom. The Jehovah's Witness case begins in Superior Court at Quebec City's imposing Palais de Justice on November 15, 1948. Because the witnesses are challenging the validity of the city's bylaw, Quebec's Attorney General is party to the action. Premier Maurice Duplessis is the Attorney General. 
On the bench, Justice Leo Casgrain, who will adjourn the case for months at a time. The witnesses engage Sam Schwartz Bard, a respected litigator from Montreal. Assisting Bard is Glenn Howell, who can't take the case himself because he is not a member of the Quebec Bar. Sam Bard was a true intellectual, a very clever man. Uh, he was delighted with our cases. He used to always say that other cases make me money, but these are cases that have life in them. Bard argues that distributing pamphlets on street corners and preaching door to door is fundamental to the witness faith. He contends that Quebec City's bylaw 184 violates freedom of the press and the witnesses' freedom to practice their religion. He claims freedom of religion is guaranteed by that forgotten pre-Confederation statute. Canada did have a century-old Freedom of Religion Act passed in 1852. And it's this act that the witnesses invoke in 1948. They argue that any attempt to pass provincial laws or municipal bylaws violating that act would be ultra vires, beyond the power of the province or the municipality of Quebec City. Quebec City's lawyer is Ernest Godbout. He argues that Jehovah's Witness is not a religion. And since it is not a religion, the witnesses' rights cannot be affected by a bylaw aimed at controlling nuisances on city streets. He was a, a very uh, ardent Roman Catholic. And he thought that uh, the right thing to do in this case was to bring in the priest to show that Jehovah's Witnesses were wrong, that's all. Their activities were not religious and they were, they were uh, violating the law and also violating Christian principles. Jehovah's Witness lawyer Sam Bard first calls Hayden C. Covington, chief counsel for the Witnesses in the United States. Like all witnesses, he's a minister evangelist. He knows the opposing lawyers will contend that the Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult, not a religious sect. So he cites the dictionary definition. A cult centers around and follows a person. The Witnesses, he says, don't follow a person. They follow the teachings of the Bible. Covington tells the court that Jehovah's Witnesses go door to door exactly the way Jesus Christ and the Apostles went house to house. He says each member is ordained as a minister after a prolonged period of Bible study. Covington's testimony uh, was very strong. He said this is part of our religion. We believe we have a duty to disseminate the truths of the Bible. The truths of the Bible we prepare in literature so that people can read it. Uh, we go from door to door and talk to the people, but most of them don't have, I mean, don't have time for extended discussion, so we leave them something to read, that's all. Godbu wants to bring in a whole cast of religious leaders as expert witnesses. Bard objects, but Justice Casgrain rules in favor of Godbu. For several days, the court hears supposed expert testimony from religious leaders. An expert witness has a very specific role in our courtrooms, called only when there's a contradiction in facts. The court hears endless tales of miracles, Bible quotations, and religious history. The city of Quebec uh, wanted to make it a religious argument, so they called a Catholic priest, an Anglican minister, and a Jewish rabbi, they were called in order to prove that Jehovah's Witnesses weren't really a, a religion anyway. It was really an, like an in trial of the Inquisition because the question was, did you believe what the other people believed? Gagne, the uh, Catholic priest, would uh, start off on a 30 to 40 minute dissertation on refinements that were very difficult to follow. I know the judge couldn't follow him. He used to look at us and throw up his hands. Dr. Solomon Frank, rabbi of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in Montreal, says his home is a sanctuary and should be free from outside influence. 
Rabbi Frank says his rights would be violated if the witnesses preached at his door. Sam Bird was Jewish himself, so he was cross-examining the rabbi and he said, well, so what are some of the really vital matters of your church that you would feel you had to do? Well, he said the fasting on atonement day would be one. Well, all right, well, now, suppose that under guise of health or something, but really secretly to interfere with you, uh, they passed a law saying that everybody, you couldn't uh, fast on that day. What would you do? Well, I would certainly have to fast, he said. So uh, whether, the gov whether the government said so or not, yes, indeed. Thank you. No further questions. The religious experts don't seem to care what the witnesses believe in. They do care what the witnesses say about the government and other religions. The Anglican fellow, the Reverend Evans, thought it was just scandalous that we should publish anything like the Quebec Spurring Hate. So, oh, well, you we asked him, do you challenge the truth of this? And he said, I think it's a tendentious perversion of the truth. He said, fine, show us one line in that that's not true. Tell us about it. If it's true, is there anything wrong with publishing the truth? Well, no, he said, if it's true, it can be published. That's fine, thank you very much. It was just like a Bible study right in the courthouse, you know, which was very interesting, you know. But, um, and especially when they ask, well, uh, why won't you go and get a permit from the chief of police? Well, why should we go to the chief of police to get a permit when we already have a permit from the, from the supreme authority of the universe? Noel Dorian, who appears for Attorney General Duplessis, steers clear of the religious argument and takes the legal high ground. He says the bylaw comes under the city's powers to control the streets to prevent disorder and ensure the safety of its citizens. Dorian was a, a cool and definite lawyer. And uh, he, he fought it from a legal standpoint. He wasn't the least bit interested in this religious stuff that, that Godbu was relying on. He knew that was going no place. After 20 days of testimony and months of adjournments, the verdict is no surprise. Justice Cazgrain ignores the religious testimony and accepts Noel Dorian's argument. The bylaw is a measure for ensuring safety in the streets and within the competence of the city and the province to enact. As far as Sam and I were concerned, we had already determined that this was, was wrong, that, that uh, censorship and a, a freedom of the press in a democracy simply couldn't live together and we expected the trial judge would go against us so we were all ready to go to the court of appeal which we immediately did meanwhile the witnesses continue their work but for them there is no safety on quebec city streets during the week, we had uh, started to advertise in town that we would have a Bible lecture in this home. And then, of course, they knew the time we were going to have it. And so they all gathered there. It was a well-organized, orchestrated thing. All you need is an instigator, someone that will start the problem. And um, he starts to yell and shout. And then the youngsters gather around, and they start to shout and yell. Then the neighborhood uh, comes out and they join the chorus. As Jesus mentioned so wisely in Matthew 24, 9, that you will be the object of hatred of all the nations on account of my name. And we were living the reality of that verse. Pressure on the witnesses is unrelenting. They are hounded in the streets and in their homes. Some lose jobs because they have served prison time, and a few break down under the constant tension. 
the witness's legal team, Bard and Hal, now take the case to Quebec's Court of Appeal, the Queen's Bench, to appeal Justice Kaz Grand's ruling. An unsympathetic five-judge panel hears the case and rejects their appeal. Another defeat. They ruled against us four to one. They all, they adopted Judge Cosgrand's uh, argument. The lone dissenter, Justice J. Bertrand, finds the Quebec City bylaw does interfere with the witnesses' ability to practice their religion and violates their right to religious freedom. The dissent opens the door to an appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. The Sumer case has dragged on for six years, stalled by Quebec's Premier Duplessis, his lawyers and friendly courts. Now it all goes to the court of last resort, the Supreme Court of Canada. Will it still be denied? Sumer versus the City of Quebec is no routine case. Before the nine Supreme Court justices, the Jehovah's Witnesses will argue that their fundamental rights, freedom of religion, and freedom of the press have been violated by the Quebec City bylaw. The problem is that these rights are not set down anywhere in Canadian law. Newspapers put the story on the front page. I think the Jehovah's Witnesses cases of the late 40s and 50s help to create a public consciousness about the centrality of civil liberties in our system. Young Glenn Howe is on his feet for four long days. We had to prepare an extensive argument because there was very little law in the common law of countries on the freedom of speech and freedom of the press. So we had to go back a long way, finding, uh, uh, digging right back to democratic basic principles or in history as well as uh, other places to find any law on the point. Howe's case fills a brief of almost a thousand pages. He even reaches back to 14th century England and the heresy trial of church critic John Wycliffe. But a hostile Chief Justice C.J. Renfrit wants Howe to justify the witness's vicious attacks on the Catholic Church. He says, look at the kind of language Jehovah's Witnesses use, calling the Catholic Church the whore. He says, nobody should talk like that. That certainly has to be a limit somewhere. That's not freedom of religion. This is just abuse. So we went up to the library and got out the Webster's International Dictionary at the time. And you looked up under the word whore, it said an expression used to mean the Roman Catholic Church during the 17th and 18th century. But this was a very common expression in, in religious literature for hundreds of years ago. So that sort of quieted the whole thing down. For the last three days of what will be a seven-day hearing, lawyers defend the validity of the bylaw. The city's counsel, Ernest Godbout, tells the court Jehovah's Witness is not a religion. Elie Beaulieu, representing the province, says the city has every right to prevent the distribution of any written matter that might touch off disorder or violence. It is not an easy decision for the court. And from the tone of the hearing, it's clear there is no hope of unanimity from the nine justices. Seven years after Laurier Sommer was arrested in St. Eustache and hauled before a magistrate's court, and seven months after the Supreme Court of Canada heard the case, Canada's highest court is ready to hand down its decision. On October 6, 1953, a split Supreme Court rules five to four in favor of Laurier Sumer and the Jehovah's Witnesses. The majority holds that religious and press freedoms have been violated by the Quebec City bylaw. The city is told to stop acting against the Witnesses. It's a majority. Five out of nine decide the Jehovah's Witnesses are free to distribute their religious tracts on the streets of Quebec City. 
newspapers appreciated and approved what we had done in bringing those cases up. So we got uh, a lot of respectability. Now we had the freedom to fill our bags with literature and be able to go out in the ministry. The province of Quebec was, was divided into two circuits. Uh, one was Laurier's and one was mine. And uh, of course, we went out uh, and took the lead in uh, helping to reach the hearts of the Quebec people and show them that our literature had a value and it was important for them to give it consideration. Freed by the court ruling, the few hundred Quebec witnesses go back to work. But their newfound freedom will be short-lived. Three months later, a furious and embarrassed Premier Duplessis attacks again. On January 24, 1954, Duplessis' Union Nationale government passes a bill giving it the power to ban any religious group that attacks other religions. Newspapers outside Quebec give voice to the nation's outrage. All of a sudden, we have this totalitarian premier in Quebec who's interfering with Christians, even though the Christians were saying unpleasant things in an, about the Roman Catholics and doing so in an, in an unprovoked and, um, and unnecessary way. And people became interested in this. They became interested in the treatment of Jehovah's Witnesses. When that bill was instituted and became law, and it had the, the, the means of confiscating all our literature, and so we had to assemble all the literature of the province of Quebec and all our congregations and move them out of the province into Ontario in Ottawa and Cornwall, which was a real, real challenge for us. The Plessy got up and said, this will put an end to Jehovah's Witnesses. And the newspapers said, the finish of Jehovah's Witnesses, they're done now. We've passed a law directly against them. The moment it became law, we had people in the public uh, gallery uh, in the legislation, and uh, they um, informed us when it became law, and immediately when it does, we went to the Superior Court and uh, already presented our petition, our request for injunction on the illegality or unconstitutionality of the bill. And um, the Secretary of the Court says, you people don't waste any time. Duplessis never does enforce his new law. He knows it will be swiftly overturned by the courts, but it keeps the witnesses on edge for months. They decide they need permanent protection against totalitarian acts of government. By the end of World War II, the Jehovah's Witnesses have been active in Canada for half a century, their numbers increasing steadily. Maurice Duplessis' War Without Mercy strengthens their resolve and they respond by campaigning for a Bill of Rights, a guarantee of rights and freedoms for all Canadians. We're basically talking about those freedoms that are considered inherent to the democratic system. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of association. The time is ripe. People all over the world are demanding protection from arbitrary acts of government. We began to see what was happening in countries like South Africa, the southern United States. These became all factors making more and more people sensitive to the importance of human rights and civil liberties. If you track the history of the Canadian Bill of Rights, you know that it was 1946 that John Diefenbaker, who whose government eventually enacted the human rights, first got up in the House of Commons and said there should be one. And after that, the, the uh, ball began to gather some momentum, and lots of people talked about a Bill of Rights. The witnesses mount an awesome publicity campaign. In September 1948, hundreds of thousands of magazines and pamphlets are distributed. They began a, a nationwide petition campaign. And in a matter of months, they got 500,000 Canadians to sign a petition saying there should be a Canadian Bill of Rights. Most people probably didn't care a whole bunch about the Jehovah's Witnesses and their fight for civil rights, but people were interested in, the, in a Bill of Rights, and that's why half a million in a country of 12 million signed. 
The Diefenbaker Bill of Rights was uh, enacted by the federal government in 1960, but unfortunately, um, it was never very successful from the point of view of protecting rights. Diefenbaker's bill is simply another act of parliament. It has no power over the laws and actions of provinces where many rights abuses take place. Even worse, the courts are reluctant to enforce it. They didn't feel comfortable using their power against parliament. And for that, they needed to have constitutional rights that were entrenched as the supreme law of the land. In 1982, Pierre Trudeau and nine of ten provinces agree to a Charter of Rights and Freedoms as part of a Canadian constitution. The Charter is now the fundamental law of the land. What was new about the Charter is that it gave the courts the power for the first time to strike down legislation uh, that interfered with individual rights. The existence of the Charter means that governments at all levels, and police officers too, will have to think twice uh, before taking action. Individual Canadians now have protection against abusive acts of government. That protection was won in large part by Laurier Samur and other Jehovah's Witnesses. They rejected arbitrary limits on their freedom and, in the process, gained rights and freedoms for the nation. Lisez la tour de garde et réveillez-vous. Lisez la tour de garde et réveillez-vous. Almost inevitably, what will happen in society is that some group, it might be Jehovah's Witnesses, as it was in the uh, 40s and 50s, will have their civil liberties violated. The key to the viability of our whole system is the ability of the rest of us to understand that violations there can cause violations here. That there is an interdependence in the way our society works. That if we make the mistake of not going to bat even for those who may be unpopular, we could wind up experiencing the same thing ourselves. Would you like to read the Watchtower and Wait magazines? I have them in English. No. You're very welcome. Have a nice day. On invite tout le monde à lire ces périodiques, madame. Très bon article. On a très bon article de l'aide pour les femmes battues. C'est très à la mode aujourd'hui. Et malheureusement, on vit dans une situation comme ça aujourd'hui. Si vous aimeriez lire, ça me ferait plaisir de vous laisser. Bonne journée. Today, the case of City of Quebec versus Sommer is an essential study in Canadian law schools. But the man who gave his name to the case, Laurier Sommer, is long forgotten. Sommer stayed on in Quebec and continued his work with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Glenn Howe is still practicing law and works as a consultant. The struggle for any freedom, including freedom of religion, is not ended with one court case. Defining our rights, redefining the law, is the never-ending task of history's courtroom.